Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, meeting of the Belgrade Legal Theory Group. I will be your uh, moderator for the day. My name is Stefan Rakic. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Strasbourg. Today, we will be discussing uh, rule of law backsliding in Europe, what it is and what can be done about it. Uh, and our speakers today will be Professor Sebastian Platon uh, from the University of Belgrade Faculty of Law, where he teaches administrative law, EU institutional law, human rights, European law, and uh, European local authorities. Uh, and the, our second uh, guest for today will be uh, another distinguished uh, legal scholar in the field of uh, EU law, that is Professor Laurent Pesch, who is a professor of European law. He's also Jean Monnet Chair and uh, head of the law and politics department at Middlesex University in the United Kingdom. So without any further ado, I would just like to ask uh, everyone who is joining the meeting to uh, please mute themselves and uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, when, when it is time for discussion. Without any further ado, I would like to invite our speakers to take the word. Professors, please. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, so, Dobro Jutro, Dobardan. Uh, I think it's 12 in uh, Serbia. Um, so, let me share my screen. Uh, we have a, a PowerPoint uh, presentations um, and hopefully, uh, if you don't see it now, let me launch it. Um, now, it should be in a full screen mode. Uh, if uh, you can confirm this, then I can get started. Stefan, can you see in the PowerPoint in full screen mode? Yes, the PowerPoint is okay. indeed in full screen mode on my screen. Oh, okay, very good. So essentially, uh, we have uh, one hour together today. Uh, with Professor Platon, we have agreed to essentially uh, talk for about half an hour, more or less, and then uh, we'd be happy to answer uh, questions for uh, the other half, the second half of the session. Uh, we have divided the presentation uh, between the two of us as well. So, uh, Professor Platon is going to deal with the uh, rule of law toolbox, uh, so a, a kind of the set of tools, instruments, legal remedies uh, available to the EU to deal with uh, what uh, we have called the rule of law backsliding. My job, in fact, is to explain uh, both the concept of the rule of law first and then to tell you a bit more about uh, what we mean by rule of law backsliding. And then once I'm done, I will give the floor uh, to Professor Platon. So what you're seeing uh, on the slide, which is essentially about the meaning of the rule of law in EU law, is a recent uh, uh, definition adopted by the Council and the Parliament on the basis of a proposal from the European Commission. Uh, this is Article 2 of the famous or infamous uh, conditionality, rule of law conditionality regulation adopted by EU institutions after a lot of uh, tensions and a lot of controversies uh, this past year, especially between, obviously, the Hungarian and Polish governments and the rest of the EU. Uh, actually, just uh, before we started, uh, I saw uh, that uh, the Polish government and the Hungarian government have finally lodged uh, their new month action against this conditionality regulation. So, uh, this is happening uh, now. And this con article 2 you're reading, uh, you're looking at, is part of this conditionality regulation. In a way, uh, there was no need for definition of the rule of law to be inserted into this regulation because we already know uh, the meaning or we knew the meaning of the rule of law prior to this regulation being adopted. But this is an answer to the tired, uh, uh, repeated argument we have heard from Budapest and Warsaw that there is no such thing as the rule of law because it is not uh, defined in a single provision in the EU treaties. I mean, I'm happy to answer our argument about uh, this definitional issue, but uh, it is wrong to say that the rule of law was never defined in EU law. I mean, you just have to read the case law of the Court of Justice. And uh, in fact, as a matter of law, you cannot join the EU without uh, committing yourself uh, with the concept of the rule of law. So if you're a candidate country like Serbia, actually, uh, you would know that uh, there is such a thing as a rule of law. In fact, uh, because you have two chapters of the EU acquis to satisfy when you are an EU candidate country. And I am uh, myself, uh, I used to work as an EU uh, law consultant, uh, telling essentially candidate countries uh, what to do in terms of adjusting the legal framework to EU uh, rule of law standards. 
So anyway, uh, just long story short, uh, if you're looking for a definition, a recent one of what is the rule of law in EU law, then look no further than Article 2 of this conditionality regulation, which is going to be the subject of, uh, as I said, uh, an annulment action. I can already predict, perhaps Professor Platon is going to disagree with me, but my prediction is that uh, the annulment actions uh, lodged by the British government and the Hungarian government are going to fail and they're going to fail badly. Uh, because none of the legal arguments raised by the two governments are just uh, are serious. Anyway, uh, so you have a definition of the rule of law here, uh, which is actually in line uh, with uh, national legal traditions, including the uh, legal traditions of Poland and Hungary. Uh, that is, uh, when there were uh, democratic uh, states uh, based on the rule of law. So there is such a thing as a rule of law in EU law. That's my main point at this stage. So now let me move on. Uh, but uh, what do we mean by rule of law backsliding? Uh, this is a definition uh, from uh, one of my uh, previous articles uh, co-authored with Professor Shepelet. Uh, so the notion of a democratic or rule of law backsliding uh, essentially refers to a process. It's very important to understand that this is not uh, kind of an um, end result. This is a process and this is a deliberate process. Essentially, what I mean by rule of law backsliding, I mean the deliberate attempt to actually undermine respect for the rule of law on the basis of a step-by-step -step blueprint. This uh, autocratic blueprint, to, uh, in a different way, has been, uh, has been implemented in Hungary and is being implemented in Poland. And arguably, perhaps I shouldn't make controversial statements about Serbia this morning, but arguably, uh, perhaps, uh, in fact, Serbia is one, another one of the possible uh, case studies we have to pay attention when it comes to rule of law backsliding. This is a process essentially where you're trying not to improve compliance with the rule of law, but on the contrary, you deliberately undermine the rule of law as defined on my previous slide. One of the key targets uh, usually, uh, um, one of the first uh, uh, target uh, uh, usually uh, is uh, independent courts. So whenever uh, you are newly elected and you seek to become the new autocrat and to make sure that you're going to triumph at the next elections, what are you going to do? You're going to target uh, independent courts and you're going to uh, you're target independent media. The aim, what is the aim? The long-term aim is to dismantle the liberal democratic state and to entrench the de facto long-term rule of the dominant party. So essentially, rule of law backsliding, what is the end game? The end game is not the destruction of the rule of law as a, as a goal. Uh, the destruction of the rule of law is a means to another goal, which is essentially a de facto one-party state. Uh, even though uh, you're going to formally remain a democracy. So the aim is to formally uh, remain a democracy, but then uh, it's just uh, an hollow version of democracy. Uh, you, you, are de facto an you, you are de facto an ele electoral autocracy. So this is what we mean by rule of law backsliding. In the EU, we have uh, two main uh, cases, uh, Exhibit A being Hungary since 2010, and Poland since uh, uh, the end of 2015. Um, rule of law backsliding has finally been identified uh, as uh, a key, one of the most pressing challenges faced by the EU. This is what you're looking at here is a, a short uh, quote from uh, uh, the former uh, European Commissioner for Jobs, Growth and so on from January 2019. Uh, he mentioned uh, Romania in 2019, but Romania is no longer uh, engaged in the backsliding process, but he was. So he was correct to point out that Romania was similarly engaged in a rule of law backsliding between 2016 and 2018, or at least until there was a change of government. Interestingly enough, uh, in the case of Romania, uh, it was not a right-wing government, but a left-wing government uh, responsible for this process of rule of law backsliding. Uh, long story short, uh, there, was there were elections and then uh, the new uh, right-wing government uh, put an end to this process, deliberate process of undermining the rule of law. In the case of Romania, it was mostly about uh, legalization of uh, corruption uh, because essentially we are looking at the consolidation of a, of a, of a type of mafia state. 
uh, in Romania for two years. Uh, this has come to an end. So essentially at this stage, uh, in terms of autocratization, Hungary and Poland remain the two most important uh, significant uh, problems uh, uh, from the point of view of rule of law backsliding. Even though this is from 2019, just remember that rule of law backsliding is not actually uh, new or recent. Um, in fact, the first time the European Commission identified the uh, rule of law backsliding without using the concept was in 2012. Uh, José Manuel Barros was then the president of the European Commission. Um, he spoke in this uh, speech, um, he referred in his speech to a new, a new type of threats to the legal democratic fabric in some of our European states. Uh, in those days, uh, three countries uh, were in the news uh, from a rule of law backsliding point of view. Hungary, uh, who was already governed by Viktor Orban. Uh, Romania, again, uh, was in the news in 2012, uh, but uh, non-compliance with rulings of the Constitutional Court. And then, uh, surprise, surprise, possibly because po people have forgotten, uh, Sarkozy's France uh, was also uh, mentioned uh, as the third problematical case. In the case of Romania then, and in the case of France, uh, the situation was actually uh, dealt with quite quickly. In the case of France, mostly because the judiciary was fully independent. So the illegal attempts by Sarkozy to uh, collectively deport uh, people of Rome descent uh, was quickly essentially uh, uh, they were quickly essentially dealt with uh, by the French uh, judiciary, uh, the admin uh, system, of course, or the system of admin courts, I should say, rather. Uh, but from an EU point of view, this is when finally the problem was acknowledged for the first time. Sadly, uh, the EU made a mistake, arguably in 2012, uh, but Professor Platon will uh, tell you more about this. In 2012, they decided that uh, the toolbox was not uh, essentially designed to deal with uh, rule of law backsliding. So instead of using infringement actions, uh, what did they do? Uh, they said, let's create a new tool, uh, which is known as the pre-article 70. So uh, Professor Plateau will tell you about this pre-article article, uh, pre -article 7 tool, and we'll tell you also about article 7. What I can tell you is that both have been activated in 2016, in the period 2016, 2018. But it's very important to understand that rule of law backsliding is not new, has been going on for at least 10 years in the EU. Uh, now, why should we care about it uh, from an EU law point of view? Uh, because of the specific characteristics of EU law, what you're looking at here is uh, two paragraphs uh, from uh, um, essentially an opinion of the Court of Justice uh, describing essentially uh, very well, in my view, the interconnected nature of the EU legal system, meaning what's happening in Hungary, what's happening in Poland is affecting the functioning of the EU legal order because of the interconnected nature, the structured network of principles, rules, and mutually inter interdependent legal relations existing in the EU legal framework. This is why we cannot ignore uh, the situation in Poland and Hungary, because it has a direct impact, not only on the way EU law is shaped, defined, but also on the way EU law is enforced. Not only also, we have to be mindful of the infringement of all the fundamental rights of Polish and Hungarian citizens, uh, obviously, in addition to being worried about the functioning of the EU legal system. So this is why we have to worry about rule of law backsliding. If you care about the functioning of the EU legal system, you cannot ignore a rule of law backsliding happening in specific individual countries because to put it in a different way, we all in this uh, together, when you share a common legal system, you cannot ignore obviously uh, deliberate dismantlement of checks and balances happening at the local level. Uh, in a way, uh, the EU is very much a legal federation. So this is why you cannot ignore uh, the destruction of the rule of law, because it means essentially federal law stops being applied in some specific countries. Now, uh, to end uh, my section uh, uh, of the presentation, I just wanted us to possibly, I thought it'd be useful to visualize the uh, rule of law backsliding, because otherwise you think possibly that it's too abstract, too abstract so one cannot really understand how bad the situation has gotten. 
Um, the worst uh, case of rule of law backsliding in the EU is by far Hungary, uh, to the extent that Hungary is no longer considered a democracy. So we have at least one EU member state uh, which has stopped being recognized as a democracy uh, since 2019. This is a fundamental violation of EU treaties because EU membership is only available to democratic states. So we have one country fully uh, in, in full violation of the basic condition governing EU membership, which is to be a democratic base on the rule of law. Hungary now is uh, more regularly described as an electoral autocracy or hybrid regime. So what is not uh, for sure, it is not anymore a democracy based on the rule of law. Uh, but uh, sadly, uh, Hungary is not the only country worth mentioning when it comes to autocratization. Uh, very long word, but essentially uh, by autocratization, I mean the process of rule of law backsliding. Uh, Poland is one of the worst uh, uh, countries in the world in terms of autocratization. If you start, if you use 2015 as a starting date, you can see also Serbia here uh, uh, minus 6.2 percent when it comes to the benchmark known as uh, uh, constraints on government powers. This is, by the way, from the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. That's the 2020 edition of the World Justice Project. Uh, so the most sophisticated uh, uh, annual uh, rule of law uh, measurement index. Uh, here, what you're looking at is the top 10 uh, autocratizing countries uh, in the world in the past 10 years. Uh, actually, uh, the last edition of this uh, VDEM annual report was published yesterday. The number one country uh, since yesterday for the period 2010-2020 is Poland now in terms of decline. Uh, but look at Hungary, it is now uh, like Turkey considered an electoral autocracy. So essentially, but Turkey, unlike, the, unlike Hungary, is not a member of the EU. Uh, is a candidate country. Uh, I can see uh, Serbia also mentioned on the list. So Serbia also is no longer considered a democracy according to uh, the VDEM uh, expert. The last uh, report uh, for 2021 was published yesterday. If you're interested, there's plenty of data. But it means also that uh, Turkey, like Serbia, uh, obviously uh, should not, uh, I, I would say, uh, we should, uh, EU membership uh, discussion, uh, if anything, are not going to go anywhere because uh, Serbia and Turkey are both in fundamental breach of the basic EU membership condition, which is to be a democracy based on the rule of law. Uh, I'm just the messenger here, by the way. This is not uh, my data. This is the data from the World Justice Project and uh, the uh, VDEM, so-called VDEM uh, project, which is the largest network of democracy experts, as far as I know. And, and that's it uh, for me. I'm now going to pass uh, the virtual mic uh, to uh, Professor Platon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, I'm, I'm not very used to uh, WebEx, but I, I see an icon that allows me to take control of the slide. Yeah, otherwise, I, I can, otherwise uh, Sebastian, I can be your, your personal assistant. Oh. I, I would hate giving you order. I, I don't feel like I, I have the legitimacy. Okay. To, yeah. Yeah. I have now given you control. I think. There you go. I'd rather have that. Uh, so how does it work then? Uh, I'm not sure. I see how I change. So you are now controlling my screen. Oh, I think, that, yeah, I think there's a lag. Yes, I think there's a lag. Okay, so I think it works. Uh, so, uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Stefan and the uh, Belgrade uh, Legal Theory Group for uh, the invitation, for the very kind uh, invitation, for allowing us to talk about a topic uh, which, uh, as Laurent says, is not new. It has been, uh, has been cooking for uh, more than a decade now. Uh, but it has been, it has become uh, hotter and hotter uh, in the last years, uh, and especially last year, due to the uh, the, the feud uh, 
between uh, Hungary and Poland on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand, in the context of the, the COVID pandemic and the uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, recovery fund. So what I'm going to address now, uh, quite briefly, as, as Laurent said, in order to give time for questions, is uh, the rule of law toolbox of the European Union. Uh, contrary to what is usually said, the European Union is not completely disarmed against uh, what Laurent calls the rule of law backsliding, even though it is true that for a long time there was an assumption embedded in uh, the EU culture uh, that uh, things like rule of law backslidings were impossible. You know, I think for a long time there was, especially after the, the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a strong belief in the European Union uh, that, uh, you know, we were heading towards the, the head of history, to quote Francis Fukuyama, and that we were inevitably going towards democracy and that any reverse movement would be absolutely impossible. So because of this quasi-religious belief, I think a phenomenon like the one we are witnessing now was not really forecasted. And even Article 7, and we've talked about, I think, and, and if you look at the way it was uh, designed, uh, mostly it was it was more about a potential coup or, you know, a military uh, push or something like that, you know, a brutal installment of, of dictatorship in, in the country rather than this slow motion destruction that we are witnessing. So I think it's fair to assume that what we are witnessing was poorly forecasted. That said, uh, in the toolbox of the European Union, we have several tools uh, of diverse degrees of efficiency, which I'm going to present in turn. So there is the famous Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union. There is what is now called the rule of law cycle. Uh, there is a, the rule of law budget conditionality, which is probably the, the newest tool in the box, but unfortunately not ready to be used for reasons I will try to explain. Uh, and uh, there is obviously the Court of Justice of the European Union, but I've decided to divide the presentation of the role of the court into two procedures before the court, because I think that these two procedures are slightly different, both in terms of their design and in terms of their efficiency. So I think it's it's relevant to distinguish them, even though both procedures involve the, the Court of Justice of the European Union. So I'm trying to change slide, but it requires some time, apparently. Doesn't seem to work. Okay. So, uh, Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union, so that's the uh, possibly the most famous uh, provision about that. Uh, and it was designed, well, I said designed precisely for this kind of situation but maybe not exactly for this kind of situation. As I said, uh, if we look at the discussions around Article 7, you realize it was more designed for a brutal collapse of democracy rather than a rule of law backsliding. But in any case, Article 7 is typically a provision that was designed to uh, address uh, the shift from democracy to non-democracy. Uh, and it is divided into two procedures, which are, I think it's important to uh, insist on that, they are independent from one another. Uh, we, you can activate Article 7, 2, and 3 directly without first activating, uh, activating 7, 1. I think it's important to emphasize that. So, Article 7, 
paragraph one, that's the preventative uh, procedure when there is a clear risk of a serious breach of European values. Uh, and uh, in order for this statement to be made, requires four fifths of the member states minus, of course, the member state involved. It's just a statement, so it's just about signaling an issue. Uh, there's no sanction attached to this uh, first part. Then you have Article 7, 2, and 3. And again, I insist it looks like a process. It's not okay. You can go directly to seven, two, and three without without activating seven, one first. The two are uh, independent. Uh, Article seven, two, and three are about uh, a serious and persistent breach of EU values. It requires unanimity minus, of course, the member state involved, and this is the one having potential teeth because it can lead to suspension of rights of the member state involved. Uh, mostly, it's about the right to vote in council, uh, but it's an open list, so other rights might be suspended, like the right to uh, funds, the right uh, to uh, European arrest warrants. You know, we don't know exactly what is a right of a member state, okay? Uh, but we know at least that the right to vote in council is one of the rights that can be suspended. And as Laurent said in Article 2014, there was a pre-Article 7 procedure that was created by the European Commission. And for the European Commission, it's a procedure that applies to the European Commission when it plans to activate Article 7. It's mostly a, a dialogue with the state prior to activating Article 7. Uh, Article 7.1 was initiated uh, by the European Commission uh, regarding Poland in 2017 after the whole process of the pre-Article 7 uh, dialogue, which took most part of, you know, uh, two years at the end of the day. Uh, and it was activated uh, later on by the European Parliament regarding Hungary in 2018. However, this procedure has proved very ineffective, mostly because uh, both countries both countries support one another, and uh, because of the lack of will on the part of the council to move forward. So there still haven't been any vote, any formal vote, even on Poland, which is the the most the oldest offender, so to speak. Uh, currently, the hearings at the council are suspended due to COVID. That's a convenient pretext because other reunions in council are not suspended. They, they happen by video conference or other way. Uh, and interestingly enough, the European Parliament, which has initiated the procedure against Hungary, has been preventing from speaking at hearings. So the, the procedure is very, in fact, poorly uh, implemented, poorly designed, and is mostly uh, ineffective. Then you have the oops, sorry about that. Then you have the uh, rule of law cycle. So that's a monitoring process engineered by uh, the European Commission. And I would say, uh, I understand the initial ambition, but at the end, it doesn't really deliver. Uh, you have to understand. In order to understand this rule of law cycle, you have to understand that uh, the, the actions that had been undertaken regarding Poland and Hungary have progressively been construed by Poland and Hungary as an east-west divide. Uh, it was uh, construed as Western countries going after the Eastern countries and in a way, uh, this rule of law issue was construed as a kind of cultural uh, cultural feud between East and West. And this is why uh, the European Commission had this idea to initiate a cycle under which all member states, all of them, would have to pass muster when it comes to uh, the rule of law and the Commission would uh, issue 
uh, reports uh, about uh, each each member state. Uh, so this idea was it, it it makes sense, but at the end of the day, the, the end result is a bit disappointing. Uh, first, because of the language, you know, if you look at the report, even though you can see that the, the commission pays particular attention to the situation in Hungary and Poland, and that it insists that it's not like the rest, but still, still it's very euphemistic diplomatic language. It's about the European Commission expressing concerns or expressing strong concerns or expressing the strongest of concerns, but it's basically as far as it gets, and it's it does not uh, uh, does not go with any kind of 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 direct consequence. So at the end of the day, it, it's it's useful, but it's not very effective. The rule of law budget conditionality, that's also an interesting uh, idea to, to hit the wallet. Uh, the, and, and the idea is uh, to link the funds that are granted by the European Union to member states to respect of the rule of law. You know, as you probably know, there is uh, a lot of polit policies within the European Union that involve the European Union uh, giving funds to member states for various reasons. I'm not going to go into the detail. Uh, but what is important here to understand is that, you know, you have the European Union giving money to the states, mostly, it's not always the case, it can be more complicated than that, but usually that's the case. And then it's the member state that handles the money to fund projects and things like that. And so the idea is, if you don't have rule of law, if you don't have an independent judiciary in a country, how do you know that the funds are going to be used properly without corruption, without misuse, without embezzlement or, or any kind? So this is the idea of linking the two subjects. So the commission made a proposal in this direction uh, in 2018, and it, it, it remain dormant for a while, but when COVID happened and when there was this discussion about the recovery fund, several countries, uh, for example, uh, Austria and uh, Netherlands and other countries, they were a bit skeptical about this idea of, you know, engaging into a common debt. Okay, they didn't like this, this idea. Uh, these countries were called the frugals because they, they are known for their fiscal austerity and for their reluctance to public expense. And these frugals made the rule of law budget conditionality a condition for the acceptance of the COVID recovery pack. Uh, but the thing is, uh, by the end of the year, uh, Hungary and Poland threatened to veto uh, the recovery fund and something called the multi-annual financial framework, which is the, as the name suggests, the multi-annual financial program of the European Union. Now, bear with me here. Uh, even though the proposal of the Commission only required a majority in Council, so it could have passed despite the veto of Hungary and Poland, right? the recovery fund and the multi-annual financial framework required unanimity. So the link between the two subjects allowed Hungary and Poland to threaten to oppose their veto, even though they were going to be recipients of the recovery fund and of the multiannual financial framework, but they put that as a matter of principle. And because of that, uh, the, the proposal was progressively watered down. First, by the German presidency, which removed the teeth of the proposal uh, by abandoning first the what we call the reversed qualified majority voting. That was that the commission was to propose suspension, and this proposal was supposed to be uh, adopted unless the council at the majority reversed the proposal. That was abandoned by the German uh, presidency. 
uh, there was an insistence on the direct affectation of the budget, which is very hard to prove when you have a systemic issue, you know, when all the judges lose their independence, how can you prove that it particularly affects the budget? Uh, and there was also a possibility to appeal to the European Council, which was also a way to delay the forestall the process. So the teeth was removed, were removed, but that, that was not enough. And then the clause of the proposal of the proposal had to be removed as well by the European Council doing something extraordinary, which is that the European Council, even though it has absolutely no power to do so, decided that the regulation would not apply, would be suspended until the court has ruled on the legality of the regulation, which I didn't know Laurent told us, uh, the, the, the process has just started today. And also the European Council uh, has provided restrictive interpretation guidelines, basically behaving as a co-legislator by amending the regulation, even though it has absolutely no power for doing so. So this regulation right now is in a limbo until the court has ruled. Okay. I think it's good. Uh, kind of a lag. Sorry about that. Okay. So then you have the, the infringement procedure. So that's a procedure that is initiated either by the Commission or member states when uh, a member state violates uh, European Union law. Values are not enforceable per se. But uh, according to the case law of the court, values can be enforceable through more specific provisions of the treaties giving concrete expression to Article 2 values. Uh, and because of that, the court has been able to, uh, to find uh, infringements in several, case, several cases. This is interesting because A, infringement rulings can lead to heavy financial penalties for uh, the offending states. And B, we now have an interesting system of interim measures, which are designed to avoid fait accompli. You know, this is the idea that when the commission launches an infringement, uh, it can ask the court to order the member state to freeze the problematic legislation until the end of the proceedings in order to avoid that irreversible situations are created. The problem is this procedure depends on the commission or member states. Member states rarely initiate infringement proceedings and they never initiate value related infringement proceedings. There was an attempt recently by the Dutch parliament to push the Dutch government to do so, but at the end, you know, it didn't happen mostly due to the situation, the, the, the political situation in Netherlands. Uh, and the commission, well, the problem with the commission is that, to put it mildly, and I think Laurent would be much more severe and much less euphemistic than me, the commission lacks both a systemic vision and reactivity. Systemic vision because the commission the commission will go after a particular provision, even though in fact it's a system. You know, those governments they create a flurry of legislations which are interrelated. And if you take each legislation independently, you might say, well, it's not a big deal. But when you put them together, you realize that it is a design, there is a pattern. And the commission being in situation of nitpicking of you know, going after a particular legislation fails to embrace the full picture. And reactivity, well, what we have seen is that when member states violate orders and rulings of the court, even though the European Commission has plenty of ways to address this kind of situation, 
European Commission doesn't. We know that several orders and rulings of the court has been uh, not complied with, and yet the European Commission took all its time to react and sometimes not reacting the, the right way. I can't go into the detail of that, but if there are questions, I will be uh, happy to uh, elaborate. And then you have the preliminary ruling procedure, and that will be my final point. So that's a procedure, a cooperation procedure between national courts and the Court of Justice. So whenever a court of a national court has to deal with EU law issue, they can call the Court of Justice to provide interpretation. The good thing is that it does not require the Commission or a member state's government. It can be used by national courts of problematic member states or even by national courts of other member states when EU law requires corporations uh, between national authorities. We have seen famously, for example, an Irish court and the Dutch court, you know, putting this question uh, before the Court of Justice because they were called by the Polish judi judicial authority to uh, surrender uh, a, a, a Polish citizen for, uh, for trial. Okay, so this is very interesting. Until recently, the court has been rather timid under this procedure. And very recently, as a matter of fact, I, I, I had written a piece in which I was, you know, a bit severe with the court. However, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know if Laurent will agree with me, I feel that the, the recent ruling of the court in AB uh, on the 2nd March of 2021, so it's just a few days ago, could be a, a game changer in this context. So this was a game about, I won't go into the details, it's a very interesting ruling. It was about uh, the remedies available against the appointment of judges at the Supreme Court. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the idea. Uh, and what I find interesting is that the court goes as far as possible in the determination of a violation of EU law and the consequences to be drawn by the referring court. Usually the court of justice, you know, tends to say, you know, it's for the national court to determine the issue. It's for the national court to settle the dispute. I will provide elements, but that's not for me to judge the situation. I provide elements, but I'm not judging. Here, I think it's very, it will be, would be very, very hard for the Polish government to deny that the court clearly hints at a violation. It would not be a first though, because uh, some time ago, the, the, the court in a ruling AK went as well very far in such a determination, and it did not prevent the Polish government from denying the objects. So we will see. But what I find interesting, and that will be my final uh, statement, is that the court does not assess the national provision at stake isolately, but in the global context of rule of law backsliding. You know, through this problem of uh, remedies against appointment of judges, the court pulls the thread and manages to shed the light over the whole problems of disciplinary proceedings against judges, the absence of independence of the National Council of the Judiciary. You know, putting one thread, the court manages to shed the light on the whole picture. And I find it very interesting, and uh, I, I wonder if Laurent will agree with me or not, but I wonder if it's not a sign that the court is willing to address what some scholars have called systemic infringements. The idea that infringement procedures could be launched not against a particular legislation, but against a whole system of legislation intertwined and linked between one another by a pattern and a design and an aim at affecting the EU values. So I'm wondering if this ruling is a signal that the court is willing to address that. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Professor Spesh and P Professor Platon for a very instructive presentation. We all enjoyed it uh, very much. I mean, that is the reason why we invited you and you sure did not disappoint. So <clears throat> I would like to ask our audience uh, if they have any questions, you can do so. You can uh, ask uh, for the virtual microphone by raising your virtual hand by hovering over your name in the participants list. You should see a little hand raised. We already have one question that is from uh, our Teodora Milojkovic. She is a PhD candidate at the Central European University, first in Budapest, now in Vienna, Teodora, you have the word. Thank you, Stefan. Do you hear me well? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Great. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you a lot, professors, for this uh, presentation. Um, I hope you don't mind. I, I have a lot of questions since I'm, um, you know, closely involved in this research. So I'll start with. Firstly, I will start with soft law instruments. So as we know, the new rule of law report um, should be. Uh, released in, I think, July this year. So, as several scholars mentioned uh, in relation to the previous rule of law report, the methodology of the commission in the report was not really, um, let's say, reflecting the real issues in Hungary and Poland specifically, but also not even in other member states. So, my question is, Prof Professor Bard, for example, really uh, elaborated on that uh, in detail. My question is, do you think that the methodology of the rule of law report might change this year? And do you think that could have any, uh, let's say, uh, better effect than the previous report? Uh, second question is also in regard to the rule of law report. Um, as commission stated in several instances, uh, the rule of law reports are not a form of retaliation towards Hungary and Poland. They apply equally to all member states. So, do you think that really um, commissions can address in the same way the problems in other member states through the rule of law report? Do you think it could? Uh, do you think it makes sense really to compare all member states to this one methodology? Because as we all see, it's it's just not the problems are not the same in Hungary and Poland and in other member states. Um, that's with the, the soft law. Now, I would also like to to ask. Uh, in regard to different procedures, uh, as we saw from this recent uh, ruling that the court tackled the systematic infringement procedure, which was proposed by Professor Chappelle, I think, firstly. But this is still a um, preliminary question procedure. My, my question is, do you think that the court might be willing to actually take on the systematic infringement procedure through the Article uh, 258 uh, of the TEU? So that's my second question. And my third question, what do you think whether the 259 uh, TEU procedure, which was recently brought up by the Dutch parliament, do you think that it will have any, um, let's say, effect on other member states? Do you think there is a uh, there is opportunity to, to actually do something, um, as Professor Kuchenov said, through this intergovernmental um, willingness of under mem other member states to tackle the rule of law issues in Hungary and Poland. Thank you very much. Uh, sh should we answer or take more questions? Well, if there are any more questions, uh, if you would like to note them, I would like to ask people to raise their hands. If not, uh, you can take your time answering this question and we'll pass on to the next one. So, just to see, are there any additional questions? Please raise your hands if there are. We do have another question. Uh, I cannot see who it is, but uh, the user called user can <laughs> have the virtual microphone, please. Uh, I'm sorry, you're still muted. There we okay. go. Yes. Uh, yeah, Mir Yovanovic, professor of the law faculty in Belgrade. Thanks for for the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. I wanted to just to ask the question you basically brought up by the end of your lecture, uh, although not going into detail. But I was interested really in the 
um, the role of the European Court of Justice, uh, basically the decisions, particularly in the Portuguese case, judges, and the one that you were referring basically was the uh, Commission versus Poland mm -hmm. case. So, uh, the, the, you put it as far as possible, the court went as far as possible, which might be a euphemism for even transgressing the 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 competence in uh, in certain issues so i'm i'm wondering what's your opinion on that uh, especially regarding the relationship between the procedures the infringement procedure and the article 7 procedure uh which is obviously a difficult one but uh at least to my mind the only the 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 real one so to say uh to address the question that you are bringing up if you're bringing up the question in terms of rule of law backsliding proper so to my mind this is article 2 uh, infringement so uh article 7 would be uh the the most proper uh the most proper uh venue for addressing this issue uh, that, that's just my opinion i would like to hear your your comments on this thanks Um, should we start answering questions or should we get more questions? I suggest we get any more questions if there are some. Anybody who wants to ask one, raise your hands now, please. Well. For now, I don't see any raised hands, so I would allow myself to ask you a question. Please. So it, I wouldn't say, uh, I'm not sure it's strictly rule of law related, but we have a running theme here at the Belgrade Legal Theory Group whenever we're discussing uh, uh, basically anything that has to do with EU law. We are... Um, discussing about the PSPP affair uh, and the argument that exists between the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. I would, um, uh, there is like, there is this discussion of about, uh, about the primacy of EU law. So whether national constitutional provisions, uh, whether, uh, what, what's the relation between national constitutional provisions and the EU law? So, uh, I would say that they uh, fall under the primacy, so the, the EU law has primacy, primacy even over national constitutional provisions because, uh, well, that stems from even from the uh, Costa ruling that does not differentiate between uh, constitutional and ordinary legal norms. And again, uh, like even uh, when we're talking about um, the Treaty of Lisbon, we need to remind ourselves that this treaty, it is a repealing treaty, not an amending treaty, because the Lisbon European Union is a successor of the Maastricht one. So by ratifying the Lisbon Treaty and by accepting the entire uh, EU legal acquis, uh, the member states accepted uh, the, the entirety of EU legal order as is. And therefore, I would say that uh, even uh, national constitutional provisions are subject to EU primacy. And then again, the, uh, the equal application of EU law uh, is important uh, in terms of, uh, of the rule of law, because if uh, the decisions of the European Court of Justice or EU legal uh, instruments are not applied uh, in an equal manner in all member states. That can lead to the fact, uh, to, for example, to the circumstance that uh, we have, um, for example, I'm banalizing, we have, uh, uh, I don't know, a problem in Poland, which is contrary to a situation in Poland, which is clearly contrary to EU law. The Court of Justice does uh, make its decision, but uh, the Polish court, the Polish Supreme Court, for example, says, oh, that is contrary to our national constitution. Our constitution has supremacy, so therefore we will not uh, execute the uh, ECJ decision. I'm banalizing, but however unlikely, uh, there are some chances of such a scenario happening. 
So I would like to know what's your opinion and what's your position on the issue. Thank you. Can I answer first? And that way I can leave the difficult questions to Sebastian and I can answer the easy questions instead. I like to do that. Uh, plus I spoke first, I guess well, we, you have to give me the floor first. I think Stefan. Do you agree? Well, <laughs> then go ahead, by all means. <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, I'll start with the questions regarding the rule of law report. Um, uh, so thank you for uh, the questions. You're raising uh, difficult questions. Um, you mentioned uh, the art, so the writings by Petra. I actually agree with Professor Bard. I don't know if you've seen my analysis of the shortcomings of the rule of law report, but essentially I'm very much in line uh, with uh, Petra Bard on this. Uh, I can share, I can use the chat function to share links uh, once I'm done answering the questions. Uh, but you said, uh, so what you said about the methodology, essentially there is no methodology. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we're lawyers, so we don't do methodology anyway. Uh, so we look at the law on the books and the law uh, as the way it is applied. But uh, you do uh, more seriously, yes, uh, essentially, yeah, this was the first edition. So I think this is work in progress. Uh, I don't expect any uh, answers to the shortcomings that some of us have identified until the third edition, which is 2022. Uh, I also agree with your point about whether we are comparing uh, essentially um, the same objects. Uh, we not, in my view, uh, in some instances. We cannot compare, for instance, Hungary to the rest of the EU because Hungary is no longer a democracy. So you're comparing two different objects. You cannot compare an electoral autocracy and uh, democracies. Uh, so the, the type of shortcomings from the rule of law point of view do not have the same meaning and the same consequences when the system overall has already been corrupted to the point that uh, you no longer in a democracy category. Uh, I said that we were comparing no longer oranges with apples, uh, we were comparing oranges with uh, poison mushrooms. I think that's the expression I used uh, on this particular point. Regarding the infringement procedure, very quickly, uh, the Court of Justice can only act if it does receive uh, infringement action. The problem uh, we're facing here is that the Commission has been just not doing its job properly in terms of bringing infringement actions. I can give you a list of about 10 infringement actions uh, we should uh, be bringing right now regarding the situation of Poland and Hungary. There are multiple reasons, um, mostly non of a non-legal nature, explaining why the Commission is so reluctant to sue uh, member states when they violate the rule of law. Regarding the role of the Court of Justice, uh, very briefly, I'm sure uh, uh, Sebastian will answer this point too. Uh, I disagree with the view that Article 7 should be seen as a lex specialist, so that's wrong from a legal point of view. Uh, Article 2 values are concretized in other provisions of EU law, uh, so therefore all the infringement actions do not have to be based on Article 2, they can be based on other provisions like Article 19, which gives essentially concrete practical meaning to the rule of law laid down in Article 2 TEU. The Court of Justice has already disagreed actually implicitly about this view that Article 7 uh, should be seen as a lex specialist excluding article infringement action. So the Court of Justice has already implicitly disagreed with this legal view, which is wrong in my view. Advocate General also Tanchev uh, has already explicitly uh, disagreed with the view that infringement actions cannot be launched on topics which are already covered by Article 7. So there is uh, nothing wrong with launching Article 7 and at the same time launching infringement actions regarding uh, similar topics. Important to remember that the scope of application of Article 7 is broader than the scope of application of EU law, strictly speaking. Uh, as far as Article 70 is concerned, anything uh, can fall within the scope of this procedure, including uh, uh, areas purely uh, under essentially national jurisdiction. And regarding the primacy of EU law, which is a difficult question, I'm just going to uh, leave uh, that uh, to uh, Professor Platon about uh, the German uh, ruling. Uh, but uh, my view on this matter actually uh, are in the public domain. Uh, I was one of the uh, authors of a, a, a kind of a public reaction uh, to this uh, German ruling. Uh, in my view, an infringement action, what I can conclude on is in my view, the Commission should have launched an infringement actions against Germany uh, regarding the flagrant violation of EU law committed by the German Federal Constitutional Court. Uh, he hasn't done so, he has not done so, which is a mistake, and sadly, uh, adding insult to injury, he has also refused to launch infringement actions against uh, the, the bogus captured Polish Constitutional Tribunal. 
and uh, the, the sham Polish uh, disciplinary chamber, uh, which Sorry. are both uh, nullified essentially, uh, in a sense, uh, the AK ruling of the Court of Justice. So if you don't stop this kind of uh, open violations of the judgments of the Court of Justice, you're going to end up with a completely, uh, essentially, uh, balkanized uh, EU legal system. So thank you very much. My turn then. Uh, so I, I won't. I won't go back to the the mythology of the uh, the rule of law report. I think that uh, Laurent has covered it very well. Um, uh, maybe I will um, focus more on the on, on the other questions. Uh, the first question you asked was whether you know the A B ruling, which is in the context of a, a preliminary ruling, could have consequences as an infringement uh, procedure. Um, but you know what? I think that maybe I'm overstating it, but I think that AB could be the equivalent of the Portuguese judge's case. Uh, the Portuguese judge's case was a preliminary ruling in which the court sent a signal saying, this is what I'm ready to do. This is what I'm willing to do in the context of an infringement. And I, I saw I see that as a signal. And I think that in AB, the court is doing exactly the same thing. It's using the preliminary reference procedure to send a message. This is what I'm willing to do. And I think it can have an impact on the commission. I think Laura is right that for political reasons, the commission is reluctant to acting. However, the Portuguese judge's case allowed the commission to act. And I think what's also important is that by, if I'm right, that the court is admitting its willingness to address systemic infringement, then by doing so, the court prevents the European Commission from using the argument that such infringements are impossible. The European Commission likes to hide behind legality. The commission likes to say, I can't do that because the, it has no chance of success. You know, that's the strategy of the commission. The commission does not go for an infringement if it's not sure to win. And the commission can say, I, I don't want to go for an, a systemic infringement because, you know, this is all scholarship, blah, blah, blah. This is all an, an invention of scholars, etc. but it has no chance of success and I will lose if the court itself says, no, no, Please come. I'm ready to address infringements in context, in system, because they form a pattern and there is a design and there is a clear aim. Then the European Commission is deprived of an argument for not acting. So I think it's some, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't predict the future, right? But I think it kind of adds to the general pressure over the Commission to do something. For your question about member states and infringement, I, I think the occasion is lost, really. Um, I, I, I thought there was a momentum when the, Dutch, when the Dutch Parliament pushed towards that, when the Dutch Parliament voted this motion to ask its government to act in this direction, but then there, there, there was the, the upheaval in the, in the, the Dutch government, and the Dutch government said, well, I did not find enough friends to go along. So I don't, I, 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 I think, I, I think it's a lost call at the end of the day. I, I think that member states, you know, if member states are unwilling to push Article 7.1 in council, despite it having no effect at all, how would they go in such a litigious procedure as an infringement. They do when there is a diplomatic issue underlying, you know, um, Ireland versus uh, versus uh, UK or uh, Spain versus UK when Gibraltar uh, is involved or things like that, because there is an underlying diplomatic issue. But for the sake of values, not sure that any government is willing, and unless there would be a strong political pressure inside, the domestic political pressure inside to do so, but I, I'm not sure that uh, 
any government or any set of government would be willing to go forward. There, there's, there, I think they will assess that there's, there's not enough to win politically and there's too much to lose politically. So I, 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 I have my doubts really uh, about, you know, Article 7 versus infringement. I, I completely agree with, uh, with Laurent. Uh, I, I think you can only use the, the, the Lex Specialis uh, principle when there is a clear contradiction between the two provisions. But with Article 7, we have a political procedure. Uh, infringement is a judicial procedure, so that's not the same thing. Uh, the outcome is different. Uh, suspension of rights in one case and the other case, you know, finding of infringements with possible uh, financial penalties. So I, I, I don't think you can use Lex Specialist when you don't have a, an incompatibility, you know, a clear, uh, how can I put that, redundancy, a clear redundancy between the two, uh, the two provisions. And as Laurent said, the court clearly hinted that uh, it was not the case that there, there was no uh, prohibition to protect values other than by Article 7. Regarding primacy, uh, Stefan, how many hours do we have? Or how many days do we have? Because this is such a broad, uh, a broad issue. I, I, I will narrow it down maybe by pointing that this is the one of the very, very few cases in which Laurent and I slightly disagree. Uh, uh, Laurent published this uh, op-ed saying that, you know, uh, there is an inherent flaw in constitutional pluralism, you know, this idea that uh, the claim that constitutions have to supremacy is equally valid as the claim that EU law has to primacy and that you have, we have to find accommodations to, uh, to make these equal claims coexist, okay? And so Laurent uh, wrote, and I understand it, it, his point, Laurent wrote that uh, the interesting flaw of this approach is that it allows for arguments like the one the ones used by the, the Polish government, by the Hungarian government, uh, that uh, constitutional identity prevails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so I understand this point. Uh, I don't just share it because I think this is a misconstruction of constitutional pluralism. You know, uh, constitutional pluralism as a doctrine, as a legal theory, comes with a lot of safeguards, guarantees caveats, frameworks, etc., etc. I think that if you take a part of this doctrine for your benefit and you forget the, the whole context, this is a misuse, this is an abuse of, of legal theory. And I would say that any legal theory is liable to this kind of abuse. And you say, you see, uh, I was thinking about that recently. Uh, our colleague, uh, Kim Lane Shetley, we went with the, the concept of Franken, Franken state. Okay. Uh, this is the idea that uh, you can pick in various countries, in various legal systems, the things you need to push your agenda and to sue them together to create a kind of, of monster. Okay. Uh, this is how Hungary and Poland uses the, use the, the comparative argument, you know, it exists in France, it exists in Germany, it exists there. So I, I pick this there, I pick this there, etc, etc. I think that what they are doing is uh, a kind of uh, Franken scholarship. You know, they are picking a piece of what is of use to them in constitutional pluralism, and they take it in isolation from the rest, because this is what suits their purpose. So uh, I, I don't think you can blame constitutional pluralism for being, you know, picked on and misused no more than you can use any of the dead bodies that Dr. Frankenstein used to create its monsters at the end of the day. Well, thank you for a very illustrative response. 
I would say if our speakers feel up to it, I would open the floor for one last question. How do you feel about it? Sure. All right. So if anyone has a question, this is the last one. Feel free to raise your hand. Oh, Theodora, you have the floor, the virtual floor, of course. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry for coming again. So thank you for your answers. Um, I agree with you. Um, my last question is, um, uh, I really appreciate the, the the insight on actually the court's willingness to to tackle the inf systematic infringement procedure. I didn't really think of it that way, and and it's interesting. So my question is, if the court really um, takes on the systematic infringement procedure, or the commission has the willingness to initiate that, do you think there is space for the Article Two to become self-enforceable? Because I think this Article 19, Section 1 was pretty uh, fruitful, let's say, uh, direction of the of the court's interpretation. But but can it actually be, can the systematic infringement procedure actually perhaps embrace the Article 2 as self-enforceable um, article? So thank you very much uh, again for uh, this presentation and for your answers. Laurent, should I go? Uh, I can go very quickly and then... Yes. Uh... That way, it's easier again. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, very quickly, actually, uh, uh, there is no need to make Article 2 self-enforceable uh, because all of the values contained in Article 2 actually are detailed elsewhere in the EU primary law. So, already, there is no need. Uh, you can launch infringement actions uh, based on all the provisions of the TEU, TFEU, and the Charter. Uh, regarding systemic infringement actions, actually, uh, a point which perhaps is worth mentioning, uh, it has already been done by the Court of Justice in the context of a case I know well because I was working in Ireland then. It was to, it had something to do with the systemic violation of EU law regarding dump sites in Ireland. And then the court answered this in a systemic, so faced with a, a systemic violation of EU environmental law. It's not very ro romantic, it's about uh, dump sites, so essentially trash uh, sites all over the country in breach of EU law. And uh, interestingly enough, possibly for the first time, the Court of Justice dealt with all of the violations together in one infringement action, emphasizing the bad faith of the Irish government in terms of denying the existence of the systemic uh, pattern. Yet, so my point is what uh, Kim, uh, Dimitri, Baba are arguing, actually, uh, is nothing really new. We just have to export it from the area of EU environmental law to the EU uh, law relating to EU values and principles. The problem is not that the court is not willing to do that. The problem is that the commission is uh, again uh, just uh, acting in a way which is always about uh, five years too late. Uh, so uh, essentially what we need is a commission to be a bit more uh, original and innovative and brave in, in its legal thinking. Otherwise, uh, the Court of Justice cannot help really unless uh, the Court of Justice uh, does receive the right uh, cases uh, under uh, Article 258 with the right legal arguments presented to the Court of Justice. Uh, as Sebastian uh, pointed out, it's very, in my view, uh, quite annoying to see that the Court of Justice has to use preliminary ruling uh, cases to tell the Commission what to do under Article 258, when the job of the Commission is to preempt, I mean, uh, to do its work and uh, to, to actually let the Court of Justice, uh, give the Court of Justice the chance to evolve, I mean, to make the case law evolving. If uh, we had the same commission uh, we have now in the 1960s, you can be sure that the commission would uh, then have denied the existence of the primacy of the euro or direct effect. So, I mean, uh, this is just uh, beyond me that after 10 years of rule of law backsliding, uh, the commission is still sticking to a very narrow conservative uh, approach uh, to uh, uh, the EU infringement procedure. I could go on and on and rant uh, for hours, uh, but I'm going to stop there. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm just going to to add uh, about about European values. Are European values liable to be self enforceable? I I have to say I doubt it, and just like Laura, I don't think it's it's needed. Uh, I think it's a Rubicon that the court is not willing to cross uh, because this, you know, we're talking about very broad provisions, uh, very hard to flesh out. But I have to say, I kind of like, recently I, I was reading a piece by uh, Luke Dimitrios' speaker, 
uh, and he was developing an interesting concept of mutual amplification. Uh, the idea that uh, you know Article Two is used in combination with a more specific provision, and that it is beneficial for both of them because uh, Article Two, as Laurent said, has a broad scope. So uh, the, this broad scope scope of application can be transferred to the uh, more specific provision, and the specific provision in return uh, can be given more uh, breadth substantially by being uh, used in light of European values. So I kind of like this idea of mutual amplification. I think that there's a lot of provisions in the treaties that can be used in relation with all the values that are in Article 2. And this is one of the of, of my hobbies, but I think that there would be a lot to do about the value of democracy, I think that the value of democracy is underused judicially. And I think there's room for that. There, I think there are provisions in the treaty that could provide this kind of mutual amplification. So with this idea of mutual amplification, I think there's plenty of room for indirect enforcement of European values without crossing the Rubicon of giving them you know, self-executing effect. So, I think that we can work with what we have without going too much into to the to, to the extremes. Well, with your answer, Professor Platon, I would conclude uh, today's meeting of the Belgrade Legal Theory Group. I would like to thank our uh, participants for. Uh, their insights and questions. And most of all, I would like to thank both of you for taking the time to speak for us. You have uh, actually uh, more than justified our uh, our pick. So we are very, very glad to have you. And uh, we hope to have you, of course, again, hopefully in Belgrade. So uh, Professor Pesh uh, could- Fingers uh, crossed. Yes. I can practice my Serbian that way. Of course, yes, and you you can learn the rest of the Cyrillic alphabet that way as well. <laughs> I did try, but yeah, with that, with that. Uh, yes. Well, yes. Uh, with that being said, uh, thank you, and uh, the video of this meeting will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Do not hesitate uh, to uh, give us a follow or a like. We are a few, but we are a significant bunch, right? Yes. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. You're welcome. Yep. Have a good day.